Hello, everybody. Um, today we have a special guest, Mr. Bob Clark. Uh, I think pretty much uh, everybody in the retic world and the large constrictor world uh, should know who this man is. Um, anyhow, uh, we're happy to have you on today. And if you don't mind, Bob, can you uh, give a little bit of background uh, on yourself? Okay, uh, I am uh, happy to be here for uh, first. Uh, I am um, I am a, a python breeder for about almost fifty years, and uh, uh, I've been breeding uh, commercially since uh, uh, strictly commercially since uh, nineteen eighty eight. Uh, so, uh, uh, long time in the in the snake business. Uh, it's uh, I'm, I'm lucky to be able to do what I do, and I'm really happy that I that I've been able to make my living do it breeding pythons for so long. Yes, sir. Uh, that's awesome. Well, with this uh, podcast, everybody knows who you are, but I don't think people know who you really are, and how basically all large constrictors and the way we keep and what we have today, we wouldn't have if it wasn't for you. So would you just go on a little bit on how uh, you got into retix, why you got into retix, and um, why you focus on retix now? Uh, what brought you to that after, well, you know, yeah. the whole thing? I, uh, I, I, I was, I've always been interested in reptiles and really all, all of them. Uh, I like, I like, I like everything. Uh, I just decided a while back if I was going to do it uh, commercially, I needed to focus on some uh, something. And uh, of course, I like pythons the best, and probably reticulated pythons are the best pythons. So, I I um, uh, I have uh, tried really to keep myself focused uh, on that. Even though I like turtles and frogs and geckos, I like everything. But uh, uh, so anyway, I. Um, I, when, when I lived at home, my parents wouldn't let me keep in snakes. I couldn't have any snakes. I kind of specialized in uh, turtles in those days. And, uh, I still have turtles. In fact, I still have some of those turtles. I've got, uh, I've got a, a, a tortoise I've had for, uh, over 50 years. Um, wow. um, in, um, when I was in uh, college, uh, in the, uh, uh, mid seventies, I, I got, uh, I was a keeper, like uh, other people. You know, we didn't really think of of um, ourselves as uh, breeders. I like snakes, so I kept a snake. And uh, and um, then at some point, I realized you you can make these at home. And I thought, well, I'm going to do that. I'm going to breed some snakes. At, uh, I'm going to make my own snakes. Um, so I, at that point, I kind of transitioned from being a keeper or a collector to uh, uh, a, a breeder now, and it wasn't that easy to, to get started it was at a time when um, um, people weren't breeding any snakes you know they were uh, the, the other people were collectors as well so they we didn't have um, a lot of information we didn't have a lot of uh, um, support from other people so I was just kind of feeling my my way as I went and uh I, um, I met, uh, um, a guy in Minneapolis that had a, um, a store, the, the pet dragon, it was Terry Odegaard and he, um, he had bred some, some, uh, Indian pythons. And so uh, when I was in high school, I drove up there and I said, I, I got to learn all about this. And, uh, and, uh, uh, I know these days it seems early. You, I mean, it seems easy. You just get this get the snakes and you uh, you do this you do that then you got some eggs and then you hatch them well i uh, i felt like every step of the way toward that goal was a real accomplishment and uh, i kind of did what uh, terry did uh and uh he, he kind of he he gave me a, a little bit of input and uh, then i got two pythons <laughs> and i started from there so um those were Burmese pythons. He was breeding Burmese, and he was uh, he was doing a good job of it. And uh, at some point, I thought, you know, wouldn't it be great if you could 
not only breed these things, but you could uh, uh, make your living this way. But in those days, in the early 70s, uh, the only um, kinds of snakes uh, were the wild type. There were, weren't any morphs, there weren't any mutations, there weren't any color and pattern mutations. You know, there might be some geographic uh, variant, but uh, really we didn't have any of those things. And, uh, and so everything that you bred, you also had to, if you did breed it, you had to compete with those animals coming in from the wild, cheap. So you could breed some Burmese pythons and you could have some, and I did, and I, and I made a lot of them, but uh, they, they were being imported for about, I mean, about uh, $25 each. So I, I thought, well, maybe if I bred enough of them, I could sell them for $25 and make a living, but uh, uh, it really wasn't possible. Uh, uh, there was, the market wasn't big enough to sell that many Burmese pythons as the, you know, when they were coming in cheap and sell them at that price, I'd have to sell more than I could make. Then, um, then the best thing happened. <laughs> I got a hold of that first albino Burmese python. And at that point there was just one of those and they could come in from the wild or not. It didn't matter because there weren't any of them. So, uh, I, I got a hold of that thing and I bred those animals and, and what was great about it is I had all of them. So I, uh, I got that, um, that animal and, 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 you know, it's funny in those days, we didn't really even know if it was, if, if, if um, if albinism in snakes was genetic. I mean, uh, uh, there was an albino corn snake before, uh, before that, but other than that, there wasn't really anything out there. And I just thought, well, I bet it works. I bet it's recessive. Um, uh, I got a hold of that snake. I, 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 bred a couple generations and then in 86 in april of 86 hatched uh, the first albino the captive born first captive born albinos the biggest thing that ever happened in the reptile industry well it's, it was it, it changed the course of my life i like to say that but it really and truly changed my life and it let me do what i do now and continue to do it and so um you know I, I like my job i work hard but i really like it i like to come to work I'm here at Sunday afternoon, so. <laughs> uh, anyway, that was good. It was good for me, and I, I was happy that uh, things took that turn. I, I just want to say this, that uh, uh, I remember when I, first, when I first met you, I was, you know, the Internet was just it was fairly new and whatnot, <clears throat> and I found your website. And the little bit of stuff that I was reading and learning about you, the one of the first shows that I went to and you were there, you had just made produce uh, albino retics. And uh, they I, were. Yeah. When was that? That was 99. I think. They were they were mm -hmm. definitely amazing looking. Yeah. We but had that, never but, seen that. Those those. Uh, lavender and purple colors on him before on any snake before you know yeah the the first animal that i bought from you though was an albino burmese python and i had to buy even though those retics were right there i had to have that albino berm because it was bob clark you know <laughs> yeah I, that was uh, that was such a good thing i i um i bred hats together and uh 80, I guess it was the end of 85, and then in 86 in April, hatched out just seven of them that first year, had one one clutch with seven albinos in it, and uh, I remember when they were hatching, oh, and, I, and I, 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 uh, I let the mom take care of them, I hatched them maternally, I wasn't really even, and that's what I did in those days, I wasn't really confident in my ability to incubate eggs artificially, so I always let the mom do it. So anyway, uh, it got time for those eggs to hatch and she kind of loosened up on them. And I started, uh, I saw seven brown noses before I saw uh, an orange one. So it scared me a little bit. But anyway, they came out eventually. But, yeah, I mean, that, that clutch is such a big deal in the reptile world, not just large constrictors, because 
when you made those Burmese pythons and you continued to make them after that, all of the big names, whether it's ball pythons or large constrictors or whoever that are out now that have been around for a while, they wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you getting that animal, putting the time in, taking the chances. And yeah. then they came in and invested and started their businesses basically yeah. off of you. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, it was a, it, it was at a time where no one really considered that it, it was possible to make money breeding and selling snakes. It was a new thing. And, uh, and I think a lot of people um, doubted it. A lot of people thought, no, nah, it's not going to work. I, uh, these things are going to drop in value. Of course, we know everything does. But uh, um, I, did, I did sell the, the, uh, the first ones for very much. I, I thought it was really pushing the frontier of high prices at $4,000 for, for, for the albino. <laughs> Uh, uh, Burmese pythons, but maybe that's because I didn't quite believe it enough either. So I don't know. It's, uh, it, uh, it it worked out. Yeah, especially when you think of what the other albinos you brought into this country and started off, yeah. how much they sold for right off the bat. Well, even even the first uh, even the first albino ball python, I got that in in eighty nine. And I thought, well, it's not as good as a Burmese python. <laughs> I thought this and that won't be good, but uh, but I can probably find a buyer. And I thought, well, maybe I can sell those for four thousand dollars too. And uh, I um, I didn't, uh, but bef before the eggs hatched, I decided I'll sell them for seventy five hundred dollars. And uh, and they stayed that high for years and years. I'm surprised they never had enough. And and those those. Um, Albino uh, ball pythons were the first ball pythons I ever bred, and and I I don't really remember. I don't really remember anybody keeping and breeding ball pythons in those days, and they weren't as common. They weren't as commonly imported either. So, oh. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, I remember in the '90s, ball pythons were considered super exotic still. Yeah, like real. Yeah, weren't available. I mean, yeah. That channel hadn't opened up to bring them in. So, anyway. so uh, get, going from those Burmese pythons, what transitioned you into keeping or breeding the largest snakes in the world? Well, I, I, um, I, I think the main um, uh, mover away from. Burmese pythons were the restrictions that we had, you know, uh, or, you know, ten years ago or so, where where they started uh, clamping down on on Burmese, and and fortunately that coincided with a lot of um, reticulated python types starting to become available. So, uh, you know, in the in the in the nineties, I was uh, Breeding all the new, all the, you know, all the Burmese pythons. I was, I had, um, you know, the albinos and the uh, granites and labyrinths and, and all those things, and and I was combining those and uh, feeling pretty good about life. Um, and then they started uh, putting a squeeze on those, putting restrictions on them, and the, you know, I guess it was about when was that? About two thousand. 2012 maybe was that yeah 2012 yeah anyway and there was there was rumors about it before then and um, I had uh, I guess I got that um, I got that uh, albino um, let me get my timeline straight here I got that albino uh, retick in 94 and bred it in 99 uh, and those were the those, that was the only morph well there were there were tigers um, uh, a, a couple years before that, but those were the only reticulated morphs that were available. So, fortunately, as new kinds of retics became available, it was able to fill that void that was left uh, as the restrictions got put on Burmese pythons. Yeah, I, the, yeah, the albinos. I know 
seeing uh, when you first hatched them and you bought uh, when before you sold them out, you bought them to a few shows, seeing those, and then two years after when you made uh, your second or third clutch of albinos, I invested every penny I ever had and got one of those, and I thought it was the greatest animal I'd ever seen because I, I got another. I got a lavender albino because I couldn't afford the purple, but I was able to get a lavender, and uh, it was just the most amazing, the way the pattern changed, because all the other albinos before, you know, the, the ball python and the Burmese, it was a white and yellow snake. Exactly. So we, we just hadn't seen those colors before, so, and uh, I guess, you know, we were lucky that that original animal was a lavender, um, and uh, so that... Um, then from that, we were able to get the, uh, the white and the purple also. And I remember thinking, what is going on here? You know, I had, when I bred that, um, of course, when I bred the, the first uh, lavender and had that first uh, generation, well, I got, I got some white ones, and I hadn't seen those before. I hadn't seen any purples before. I thought, what, what's happened here? And, you know, didn't really understand it for a long time. Um, you know, re, by breeding several males and breeding uh, uh, different animals together, breeding heads together that I didn't really know what they carried. Um, you know, I didn't know if that, that hat albino was a, a white or a purple hat. I didn't know. So it was kind of hard to figure out at the beginning. And uh, I, if I, then I realized, well, when I do this, I always get that. So, but it was not. I, All of a sudden I had three different things to sell. I noticed that, um, in the beginnings of you really ramping up on producing albinos, there was a lot more white phase than anything else. Was that just something you planned, or was that just because of reading the hut to hut stuff made so many more white phases? I don't know. Um, is that really right? Did I have more whites in the beginning? I can't remember. Um, I know that, that some projects, like the Genetic Stripe, those were heavily white because that's how I started them. You know, they were... They were white for years before we got any uh, purple into those. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know, maybe. I, re I remember thinking that all of them were desirable, so uh, happy to be able to have so many different things. So, I guess and purples were the most sought after, and I remember everybody fighting over everything. Cause the, that was not, when it wasn't that common, everybody wanted to contact you and get a purple but you only had so many, so people were trying to out buy other people to get their hands on them and make deals, and that was just the craziness of a purple albino retic. Boy, those were the days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those were the days. Uh, yeah. uh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I was just going to ask, what did you have any other retics before then, like uh, in between dealing with uh, your berms that you were? Uh, producing and keeping um, yeah, and um, I got my first retics in 88 and uh, then I got um, and I didn't breed them I didn't breed them till the 90s as, as I recall and then I think it was about 94 that I got a, I, I saw the tigers and I got one of those from Carl Herman. And uh, so I got that, I got that going. So I was making some tigers. And then, um, then when I got that original albino from uh, Malaysia, uh, it didn't, um, wouldn't eat for two years. I couldn't get it to eat. And uh, it was, you know, it was about a nine, nine foot male and it, it just would not eat. And I, I didn't really know any better, but I thought if you're a nine foot retic, you're probably not big enough to breed. I didn't, I just didn't know any better. I hadn't bred any retics before. And uh, I had a, uh, um, a worker that was uh, living in my uh, snake facility in those days. And I came in to work one day and there was a Polaroid picture on my desk of that, of that, Retic breeding a female, and I thought, "Ooh, this is good. Things are. This is going to be great." And uh, of course, it were. It were pretty great after that. So, uh, 
about that time he started breeding, he started eating, and everything uh, everything went forward like it should. But before that, you know, it was a little shaky. But I, I thought he might die. I had, I really, I had to force feed him for almost a year, and it was so, uh, you know, it's just a test of wills. You don't want this? Well, sorry, <laughs> you know, you're getting it. And uh, we would we used to just fight. Oh, it was t it was really very bad. And that snake just recently, not too many years ago, passed away, didn't it? Yeah, I, I had it. I had it twenty years. So yeah, and you already had it as a nine foot animal when it came in. So that thing was probably close to thirty years old. Yeah, it, it was. He, 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 it's likely, you know, it's likely pretty hard for an albino to make a living in the wild. You know, <laughs> and, yeah. uh, he uh, he had a great big head on him, and I think he was probably pretty old. So he he. Um, he uh, started to go downhill. It took him a while to go down all the way. He uh, he just got um, to the point where uh, he just didn't want to live anymore. You know, he he mm -hmm. wouldn't eat very often. He wouldn't. Uh, he he just got sluggish, and uh, eventually he um, I, I lost him. So, but I still think it's incredible because I mean that is an old retic. I mean, with their lifespan and what they think they live to. And the fact of the story is that you couldn't get him to eat for the longest time and having to force feed him that from then on out, he started breeding and then he lived yeah. this really long, extensive life. Yeah. When you think how many descendants must that one animal have, it, it's, it's, uh, I couldn't even guess, but it must be a huge number. Oh, yeah. that, oh that original, astronomical. Yeah. That original albino Burmese pythons, but I mean, that thing. I think how many offspring that must, you know, how, how many are descended from that thing? It's just, mm -hmm. it must, it just must be an incredible number. So how long after you imported that albino, did you find and import the blonde and the type three? Um, uh, well, I can't remember that. Uh, I think the next one for me, uh, after the, albino i think it was the might have been the genetic stripe the genetic stripe yeah. yeah and a friend of mine was in indonesia and he said hey i'm at a dealer here and there's a there's a, there's a stripe per tick and i i said yeah i've seen him and he he said no this one's different he said i really think you should get it and i he said and you're gonna have to because i don't have any money and i i thought well you know i just don't i'm just not interested in that really because that stuff's not genetic and Anyway, he sent, he sent me a picture of it, and uh, I can't remember what year that was, but I thought, okay, yeah, that's good. I think I better ha I better have that. And um, and then later that year, that was a female. And later that year, a guy in England said, uh, "Hey, I saw a picture of that snake you got. I got one like it, and it's a male. You want it?" And I said, "Yes, I do." <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, yeah, I got that. That's where that's where those came from. So. I can't remember when the blondes came in. Uh, I, th I think it was after that. But you know, if it were, if there was a different retic, I got it. I, I thought, well, I'm gonna have, I, I better get it. This thing's working out pretty well. I'm gonna, if there's, if there's something new and different, I'm gonna get it. So I did. Well, yeah, most people don't, and that, that's another thing that you know I wanted to make this point about because everybody takes, everybody's breeding retics now. And everybody thinks they can just do this, that, and they know what they're going to get. But people don't realize that almost everything that you have done is the reason we have everything. Carl might have got, had the tiger, but if it wasn't for him selling you a tiger and you able to plug that into everything, we wouldn't have all the different stuff. You know, Sunfire is huge right now. Everybody puts tiger in everything, and they got animals off of you. Majority of the tigers, you know, the fluffy lines and everything else that people you know, that want. Sunfire, that Sunfire was a super that came in. I I um, I didn't know it, but I I bred that to uh, a normal, and I got a whole bunch of Sunfires. They weren't quite as good as Dad, but they were nice. <laughs> so that was a strange one. And they, you know, we didn't know. We didn't know uh, anything about a, a, a co-dominant trait in any species until the tiger. You know, I thought, hey, what's going on with this? This isn't right. But uh, anyway, I hadn't seen that before. And then the motley just occurred 
at my place. I remember that. That was the craziest thing ever and ever. <laughs> and that was one I really couldn't explain because I thought, well, where did that come from? And it was a, the first one was an albino. And I thought, well, okay, we'll put those, we'll breed that back to his mom. And, uh, and I got, uh, I got uh, motleys and albino motleys. I got, because uh, her mom was a head. And I thought, okay, I didn't really learn anything there. I just assumed that this one came from you. You must be a het for that. You show it. Now I'm bringing them back. And I got, well, anyway, of course, of course it's co-dominant too. And, um, and it just came out of nowhere. And what a surprise that was to breed two of them together and, and uh, get a white snake, you know, but the, again, the first one, first super motley was an albino. So, you know, I remember thinking, what is going on now? I got a white snake. <laughs> And, uh, and that was very uh, desirable. Now, sometimes we think, I think anyway, well, I hope it's not white. <laughs> when it yeah. But in those days, I thought, well, that's got to be the best thing there is, a white snake. So, anyway. So, so many cool things from, from, from you. I mean. Everything. I mean, think I mean, about yeah. all the different stuff. I mean, I was back, I was friends with a lot of people before the internet. And you getting your hands well, along with Jay, but mostly you, because it was everything I got was for your information, it was getting those five original ivories. Yeah, that was uh, that was uh, that was a good thing too. I was happy to have those. Yeah, you know that uh, that was huge. I mean, yeah. the first time hearing and seeing about those, what Bob's got got white snakes and uh, and they came from the wild and. He, he's going to, we're going to have white snakes, big white snakes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so good. I, I, uh, I remember that. Those, those were the, those were the good old days for sure. So out of all the projects you've done, I mean, we'll get up to the recent stuff here, but out of all the retech, let's focus on retech out of all those, what has been your favorite to do? Um, you know, it, look, when you look back, the, I think the thing that you, you get a little bit, um, things get a little bit distorted by the most recent thing, and it always seems better than the thing that's long ago that you're used to and you've already seen a lot of them. I mean, i got to say that albino was pretty good. Uh, I mean, that was a pretty wonderful thing. But I, uh, I remember when the, when the first pieds hatched, I thought, this is the best day of my, of my life. You know, I thought... This is really fantastic because um, we had seen a, a pied ball python and the original pied retic, you had to be pretty generous to call it a pied. You know, it had some, it had a white belly and a couple of white spots on its side, you know, where the belly just came up the sides a little bit. It didn't look, didn't look that special, but um, I, uh, I remember those eggs, uh, Wait, waiting for him to hatch, um, you know, we're, we're two generations down the line from the original boy. And uh, so I had bred him to one of his daughters and had the eggs. And I thought, well, I'm not, you know, so you, you get pretty, you, get a lot, you build a lot of anticipation. And, and the day that they hatch, it can be either really, really wonderful day, or you can think, well, I've I've, I've wasted five years here and, and uh, I don't really have anything to show for it. But uh, I had decided I had a nice clutch of eggs. I thought, let's just put that time off until they actually hatch. So I didn't cut them. I didn't, I didn't uh, worry over, over, I mean, I, I worried over them, but I, I didn't, I just thought I'm going to wait for them to hatch. And, uh, I, uh, I was, I went to work early that day and I was sitting in my office. It was, it was like three days before they were supposed to hatch. And, uh, I, um, I opened up the incubator just cause I got to check everything all the time. And I thought, Ooh, there, there, there's a, that one's got a cut in it. <laughs> and, um, I thought, well, I'm going to have a peek. And that snake <laughs> was everything that I had. Uh, dreamed and more than um, uh, a 
retic could be. You know, it was it was a it was a just a really super high white uh, pie. It, it was it was really very wonderful. So I I and I couldn't I couldn't believe it. It's like six in the morning. I'm there by myself doing the happy python dance, but <laughs> it, was, it was really a it was really a great day. My favorite was when uh, the way you announced that you had albino pieds when that one guy overseas thought he made the first albino pied and you popped up and goes, yeah, I remember when I made those and you showed <laughs> everybody. I forgot about that. Yeah, I forgot about that. that. Was, I was laughing so hard. I was like, classic. So but, we had um, those. Um, actually, I, I, had, I had forgotten <clears throat> when I had made that. Um, clutch i had let's see uh, we had a bunch of people come visit uh, uh carl uh, herman and monty creason and and shane and jake and uh, and actually a lot of we had a lot of people here and uh, i said hey got some retics uh, five retics getting ready to hatch i pulled that uh that um uh box out of the incubator set it on the table cut open a few eggs there were some nice pies in there and in, in those days, we thought, ooh, this is, this is really very wonderful and special. And uh, they all laughed. And, and uh, I was um, checking that the next morning, and I thought, oh, <laughs> there was a first albino in there. I hadn't even seen it. You know, I hadn't even seen one before. I forgot it was in that clutch. So I could have, I could have announced it accidentally, but I, uh, I, uh, uh, it, it didn't it didn't work that way, but I thought, ooh, that was a close one because uh, <laughs> you know there's there is a way to do things that uh, will maximize the interest and profits from a project. And I had decided, well, it's just too soon to have an albino. Let's ride the normal one for a while, and then let's have an albino. Of course, you know, it came a little sooner than I thought, and and I did I did that. I kept it quiet for maybe another year, I think. Didn't I think it's a while? Yeah, yeah, it was a while. Yeah, because that picture you posted when that when that post came up, that snake was quite a bit older. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I forgot. I forgot about that. I forgot about that. And um, that um, <laughs> that guy was a little bit of a. Um, he had. Uh, I think he had. What was he? He was unhappy about something. He hadn't got it. He had. He doubted. He, he, for some reason, he started to doubt it was an al that it was a really had albino. Yeah, I can't, remember, I can't remember why he was doubting that, but he, at some at some point, he decided that he was going to get unhappy because he didn't think it was a had albino. He never apologized to me either. No, he didn't. He didn't apologize to anybody. I know. I remember the guy's name clear as day, and he was basically for well, I years. I can't remember his well, name, but I, but I do remember he was he was really very unpleasant and he was an unpleasant person mm -hmm. and then yep. uh, he, then he hatched an albino and uh he, he, he never apologized for anything nope and then, <laughs> and then uh, i forgot about that uh yeah i had uh, i had some i've been holding back a little bit <laughs> oh, too bad for him right <laughs> that's that's why it made it so great because he had been he he had been bitching and, and complaining for years and all this, and all of a sudden he was, like, so proud that he made an albino, but he didn't give an apology or a shout-out, you know, and then all of a sudden, boom, you pop up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was um, – <laughs> I, I don't know why he actually doubted it. I can't remember – I don't know what he – he had no reason to doubt it, but he just uh, – he's just an oddball, and he he, uh, <laughs> he decided he'd been had somehow for some reason. But, uh, yeah. There's a lot of people like that around, though. Then he had a, then he had a, the big uh, he, the, the big announcement. Huh? I do remember that. I, I took a, I, I I don't I don't like to admit how much pleasure I took in that. <laughs> so. We all we all had a good laugh though when you did that. That was great. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah. So. Uh, have you imported a lot of animals that never proved out anything? Well, I got some of the first calicos that came, and, and you know that never makes anything. Um, the um, let's see what else. Uh, oh, there was a 
there was a few Burmese pythons way back that were, I call them faders. They had a very faded pattern, and that turned out not to be genetic. You, just could, you couldn't breed that any way to make a, to make a, uh, uh, a snake that looked like that. So I, I, I spun my wheels and wasted some money and time on that. Uh, I can't really think of anything else. No, it's all it's on, all gone pretty well. So. So now, now you've you, you've pretty much. I mean, we're so restricted now, being that everything's closed off from importing. You know, the motley you completely like lucked out. Now you've got something brand new that you didn't have to pay for and yeah. import and prove out. And uh, you also basically you had two animals in your collection that one is somebody else had but you've got hypo now and you had jaguar in your collection too that were wild caught yeah yeah i got that um uh i uh, one of my uh, customers in uh, the czech republic said i've got an odd looking uh retic and i said well i'll i'll get it i'll, I'll buy it didn't cost very much either and uh i bred that that's a funny story i bred that and i only had seven eggs I only had seven uh hatch and they were all normal <laughs> i had seven of them and they didn't have a jag in there and so i kept those thinking well i better keep them and breed them and um, then uh, i bred them to uh, uh i bred it to something else and got jags before i actually bred those that bred him back to those but um no I think I, I lost, did I lose those in my fire? I think I lost those in the fire before I got to breed them. Yeah, I did. I lost those. That was, that was in 2011. So I, I, I lost the, I thought I had lost that project, but I didn't lose the original male. I just lost his, his, uh, his, uh, offspring. So, uh, anyway, I, uh, I got those and I thought, Ooh, this is nice. And then I thought they're kind of squirrely though. <laughs> and, I, and, uh, I said to uh, Jeff Byers, who was working for me then, I said, hey, look at these babies, they're kind of squirrely. And he said, just like their dad. And I said, see that way? And he said, yeah. <laughs> I thought, oh. So, anyway. Now, let's talk about the biggest thing out there right now that is, I know this man over here is loving, and I think they're cool, the hypo. Yeah, I, I, um, I got a, uh, I imported that from Indonesia a long time ago, and I got off to a slow start. It was a, it was an animal that wouldn't, um, just wouldn't do right. Uh, you know, it would uh, eat for a while, then it wouldn't eat for a while. It was, it came in about eight feet long, a female, and uh, I had to get her to size. And like I said, she didn't want to eat, she didn't want to grow, and then she didn't want to breed, and then she bred, and I, I got some. Um, Hats and I raised those up, and in the meantime, she laid another clutch that wasn't any good, and then she died. So uh, uh, I just got off to a slow start with those, but uh, anyway, I'm finally, finally uh, had a nice clutch uh, this year. So they're, they're very nice. Now, have uh, you, I've seen the pictures of the hypo tigers and the fire hypos. Have you made a bunch of just the normal hypos? Um, I, I bred it to a fire early on, and so uh, there's a lot of fire in there. But I have made normals, but I make about an even number of normals and hypos both. Okay. And so, then, and then, um, uh, then when you breed the hypos together, I've got some ultras that are that are hypo. They're a little more difficult to tell when they're babies, but I, as they get some size on them, I can tell which ones I think are are um, are hypo. So. The, the pattern and the coloration on those animals are so unique, and it's untapped, so I can't yeah, believe what's really, going to happen. It isn't just the uh, color. It affects the pattern, and it, it affects the patterns on the heads, too, a little bit. So you can sort of tell. Well, I remember the animal from years ago. Yeah. When really. you, you know, like, what what is that? <laughs> yeah. That was, you know? It, it uh it was a, it was special and I and I paid a lot for it in Indonesia for, at the time I mean it seemed like a lot of, I bought it for five thousand dollars and I thought well I better have it because it looks and the, and the picture of it wasn't very good but anyway I 
and it was, turned out to be a pretty good animal. I'm glad I got did it. you did you know it was recessive right when you got it? No, well, when I bred it and I didn't get anything, I I decided it must. I hoped it was. I don't. I didn't know, but I hoped. Um, so a lot of people uh, don't also know because. Of course, you have your fan people from this person and that person. You've got all this social media stuff. But most of these people just breed snakes. And they see other people do it and they copycat it. But you being a pioneer of everything, basically, you know, you have taken time out, you know, just because you're not sitting there making videos or you're not making vlogs or doing whatever. Yeah. People don't realize that you help so many people all across the world and the fact that you're an ap actual herpetologist you're not pulling stuff out of your butt and just re regurgitating this has been your life you're an actual reptile specialist that's what a yeah, herpetologist I, is i really like it that i can do what i do and make a living i i am so lucky that that is possible for me uh and i i think about that every day and i i know people got to go to work and they think uh Pretty soon it'll be Friday and I won't have to work. Well, I'm telling you, every day I get up and I think I'm going to go to work. And then I'm here all day and then I'm uh, uh, I'm thinking about it the rest of the time. <laughs> so I, I like I like it. I'm very happy that I can do what I like to do. I'm not saying it doesn't have its own headaches and it has its own special brand. But I, I'm, I'm sure happy that I can do this. And it's really You're awesome. You get to do what you do. <laughs> It is really, I feel so lucky that I can do it. So, And it's really been cool over the years because, I mean, me and James have been around for a very long time, but over the years, you, your, you've had, your kids have been interested, and we just saw the video of your grandkids, you hatching eggs in front of them, which was awesome. <laughs> yeah, that was And they're fun. poking at them and getting all interested. Yeah, I, I like that. I put those eggs out there, and, and one of them's got to gotta poke it right in the nose <laughs> I thought, okay, not afraid so maybe, maybe some of it's uh maybe maybe some of it's in the blood <laughs> i think so when i saw that i was like oh that's definitely bob's grandkids <laughs> yeah, that, that's pretty fun yeah. you know it's just it's what you've done for everybody over the years i mean you're not only are you pioneering the different morphs and everything else, but you taught people how to keep them, how to handle them. Yeah. You know, I've heard stories. I mean, I, I, you know, I've been friends with Jeff for a long time, how you have a magic touch with animals that want to bite other people, but you'll go in there and these animals don't touch you. You just are like one with these snakes. <laughs> well, I, uh, when it comes down to it, uh, uh, most of it, I did for myself. <laughs> so, I, I liked it and I was able to, to uh, pursue it and, it and it worked out for me. So, yeah, I'm not, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that most of my effort has been here to, to further my own interests. But uh, anyway, I guess it worked out a little bit for everybody. It does. But I mean, I'm, we're, we're glad that you focus on that. But it's with like me and James and everything else. National Geographic you've been on. You, you've had multiple documentaries. You've been on David Letterman. And it's showing such a positive things with these large snakes. I mean, yeah. everything that you've done for the community and what you have brought to the table to show what everybody can do. And it's, if, this is not trying to blow smoke or anything, but literally all the big snake keepers wouldn't be anywhere now if it wasn't for what you have done and what your passion is yeah pretty much well, it's I, was lucky, I was pretty lucky to get all the good stuff you know i was i was lucky i, was, I can't uh, i can't say um, i can't say any different than that it was um, you know i i think about getting that first pipe what a what a what a gift that was you know and uh, that first albino so 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 good and i'm in that albino burmese i gotta tell you i i saw the picture of that thing in the national geographic uh there was an article about a thai animal exporter there i couldn't get that out of my head i just couldn't get that out of my head i thought about that i dreamed about it i talked about it i'm sure everybody got sick of hearing me talk about it but 
I, uh, I remember, <laughs> well, I remember uh, thinking, boy, if I could just get a hold of that. And then it showed up on Crutchfield's list. And I thought, ooh, I have got to make something happen there. So. Now, was that, was that snake, since it was a wild-caught berm, was it all right in captivity? What, what, was it mean? Did it eat? Well, it ate. It was fine, and uh, it, was, it, was, it, was a, it was a perfectly good animal. Never, it wasn't aggressive. It was just, uh, just like a captive one. So, <laughs> what, yeah. a great, what a great thing that was. And Tom right. wouldn't sell it to me. He, he wouldn't sell it. He, uh, but it, I rented it from him for a season. We did now? Did you end up after doing that whole agreement with Tom? Were you able to keep that animal, or did he take that animal from you once you were done with it? Uh, he loaned it to me for a season. I paid him for that, and then I split the babies with him. And I, and our deal was we'd go forward as partners breeding the animals that we produced, even though he owned the yellow one. And our deal was he had to keep it. It couldn't go to anybody else. He can have it, but uh, the babies are ours, and so are their babies. And then Tom came to me, and he said, hey, I want to sell that snake. And, I, and I'm thinking, great, because I don't really want a partner. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. He said, I've got a buyer for that snake. I'm going to sell it to him, and he can send me half of the babies, and we'll split it up. And I just thought, it's my birthday. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I got those babies, and I, you know, I don't even know what happened to the others. We had about 30 of them, and I sent 15 of them to Tom, and I don't know what happened to them, but uh, I'm sure he sold them, but they didn't really, as far as, I don't, as far as I know, they didn't produce anything. And then the, uh, the guy that bought the, uh, the, uh, the original animal, uh, um, he called me. And uh, he said, uh, hey, I want to buy some babies. And I said, well, I, I don't really want to sell any babies, but I'll trade, them, I'll trade you some babies for that adult. How many do you want? He said, I want four. Well, I had seven, and I'd sold some already. I said, well, I can give you two now, and I can give you two next season. And he said, okay, that's a deal. So uh, I got that one back, and then the next year I doubled my production. I had all these het females, and I had the albino male. So that worked out great. Everybody wanted an albino berm. When I was living in Florida, when all that was going on in the late 80s, it was albino berm madness, it, it, you know. It was crazy. I, I remember, you know, there were no shows in those days. There, there, were, there was no internet. There was no show. Yep. So you, um, you know, I'm, I'm uh, selling snakes over the phone, and by, I'm mailing people – pictures in the mail <laughs> so and uh yeah i i remember we we went to the international herpetological symposium in place of a show and that was a place where people you know breeding animals was new and it was we had a meeting every year and i think it started like in the 1980 or maybe before where we'd get together and people would give a talk and talk about how to breed a snake and how to breed this or that mostly zoo people but um, it was an opportunity for all of us to get together and if you had something to sell that was a place to sell it and I can remember taking a few uh, well, more than a few <laughs> albino Burmese to those meetings and uh, people come up to my hotel room and, and buy them and I, I, can, I can remember <laughs> I can remember having so much money in my pockets, I couldn't sit down. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing. That's a good day when that happens. It was great. <laughs> yeah. So with, with, with the berms and with the retics, where did you learn how to breed them? Because nobody had ever done it before. Well, I, I, um, I, I read everything. I, there was a guy in Florida that had uh, bred them one time. And he, he published a paper. Uh, and then, then there was Terry Odegaard in Minneapolis. And uh, uh, I just sucked up all I could learn and, um, and, I, and went from there. 
And so when did you switch over from doing, I know you still do it because you post and everything and it's really cool. And most people don't know that you can still do that. But when did you really go from all maternal incubation to doing pretty much majority of a uh, man-made incubator? Um, I don't know. I did it over time and, and every once in a while I'll still let a female hatch her own eggs. You know, ball pythons do it great. There's no, you don't, you don't have to do anything. Uh, but I can remember, I can, I can remember how, when I was er, early on, and this was, a, this is back in the eighties, I would have, you know, put a box in there from delay in, and generally they'd go in there and lay. And, uh, I was kind of short on case spaces and I was moving males around trying to breed all my females. And I, 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 I used to take all the female boxes and put them in this one giant cage I had and let them hatch them all the had all the females in their own boxes all next to each other in this big cage. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. So I wonder if I got a picture of that somewhere, but yeah. Yeah. If you find that, you should post that. That'd be really cool. That to see. would be yeah. really, really cool. But you to know see. what? In, in those days we didn't take so many pictures. It was a lot harder. You had to get a camera and you had to get it to take it to the moto photo. And yep. <laughs> it was not, it was not so easy to do it that, I mean, now you want to take a picture, you got a picture. But yeah. those, you know, so I may not, I may not even have a, I may not even have a picture of that. So yeah, I've got a picture from the, it's got to be late nineties. Um, at one of the shows, I can't remember whether it was Florida or up in Illinois. First time I ever met you. I'm just, I, you, you're dealing with customers and I'm standing there pointing at the Bob Clark sign. Cause I'm like, Holy cow. I'm at Bar Bob Clark's table. <laughs> I mean, you you were you were uh, basically a hero in the, in the reptile community. You still are to a lot of people. Well, I am. Um, like I said, it's sure been good for me to be able to do this. But yeah, I, I remember going to those shows and um, having having all that stuff. You know, you talk about pictures. I've still got that picture of the original albino retic when it was still in Malaysia. I got it in the mail, and uh, I'd see those international letters in my mailbox i think oh good something good something good because <laughs> you know it was expensive to even make a call you couldn't send an email and you couldn't send a anyway so i got a, I got that i got that picture i'll post that someday with uh anson wong who uh, notorious oh yeah killer. i got a so him holding the big uh that the first albino that's a that's awesome i mean that to be over there and then you have it in your possession and you seeing it from pictures and actually getting that animal, you know, we don't, we can't experience that kind of thing anymore. And, and something yep. that snake being so influential on everything now. Is, well, that's, An Anson knew it was a good thing to have. I paid $15,000 for it. The first albino. And, uh, and he knew it was, um, he knew it was good and he was going to sell it. And, uh, Boy, he uh, he he said, "Well, I'm 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 going to sell it. It could cost fifteen thousand dollars." That day, I didn't have fifteen thousand dollars, so I went to the bank and said, "I need fifteen thousand dollars. What are you going to do with it?" <laughs> I did not say, <laughs> <clears throat> but I said, "I said, well, I'm going to buy a snake." I said, "Okay." <laughs> so I got I got that one. I mean. I I wish I could do that. Yeah, I'm, I'm buying a snake from Bob Clark. Can I borrow fifteen thousand dollars? <laughs> Man, the, the the damn bank, the people here in Brenham, Texas, would look at me like I was crazy if I yeah. said some shit like that. Yeah. Anyway, I I got it. I sent it over there, and and uh, and uh, he sent me that snake. So. So, what do you think about? the uh, hobby slash industry nowadays and um, where do you think it's going and what are your plans? Um, I, um, I like to keep doing what I'm doing. I mean, uh, as long as I keep doing it, I'm going to do it. I am um, um, always looking for something new. And as far, as far as the, as far as the business going forward for, you know, at the, at the keeper level, I, I think it's, you know, I, I worry about retics because there's some, there, there's a, uh, always um, you know the forces of evil are always trying to uh, restrict us um, and and it isn't just for ticks it could be anything you know, you know 
I think they take your retics one day. They're coming after your leopard geckos next time. So, you know, all of us, all of us need to fight the battle for all of us. So, uh, you know, I even think the people that want to keep, um, you know, um, big cats, I think we got to, we got to fight with those people because it's not a far, it's not much of a leap for somebody to say, you know, and, hey, I'm, I'm a little guilty myself. I think, well, what do you need a tiger for? Well, it makes, it sounds pretty, pretty reasonable to most of the people on the planet uh, that, well, who needs a snake? Who needs a snake at all? Who needs a big snake? You know, those people, some of those people make the rules. And yep. we have to make sure that we always are fighting that battle and uh, and it, it's a it's at every level you know you know if it's um, so some some um, town in the middle of Missouri says you can't have uh, 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 alligator or a retic well we got to fight that battle too because those aren't just uh, that stuff spreads and those are our customers you know that those those people buy snakes so um, you know, we got to get behind U.S. Arc. They're pretty on top of things, and they're they're looking, they're they're fighting at every level. We got to support those people. So definitely. So because that that'll take um, that takes away our customers, and uh, pretty soon it'll come to us. I don't want, you know, I I fought it locally here too. You know, you, you do a lot for the hobby that I don't think people actually realize. But you know, all the stuff knows. that you actually do. Nobody you know? knows. Uh, the, you know, somebody comes to the city council and says, hey, I think we shouldn't let people keep uh, X, Y, or Z. Well, you know, that happened here in Oklahoma City. And um, I, I started, I went to the, um, the city council uh, members and talked to them all. They don't want to hurt anybody. They just think, well, that sounds reasonable. Who, you know, some of those snakes get big and they'll bite. <laughs> And uh, I explained it to him. I said, you know, I, this is how I live. And uh, they don't, like I say, they don't really want to hurt anybody. They, they didn't know that. They didn't know. They didn't know that, that, uh, that I, I live by breeding pythons. And uh, they, um, they um, well, we, we fought it. It went away. Yeah. If more people did stuff like what you do, instead of just complaining on Facebook, it would go a lot longer way. A lot well, longer. You got to be reasonable with those people. You got to you got to understand, like they're they're not bad people. Probably some of them are. Some of them are bad, but uh, <laughs> most of them are, probably are not. Uh, they're just trying to do the right thing. They just don't know what it is. They need a little direction. And it's unfortunate that some people have to. They they don't. Uh, they just don't have the background, and yet they're in charge of making the rules for the rest of us. So, you know, we got to educate them. Absolutely. So, Bob, what would you like to promote right now? What are some of your big breeding plans? Anything to tease us or excite us for the future here? Well, you probably should go to my website. I, I'm, I try to put some things up regularly, but, you know, there's some, there's some of these new pied retic combinations are, are really nice. Um, pied and golden child and pied and Motley and Pied and Phantom and all three of them together. There's all very nice, wonderful things. And, and uh, um, like that Pied Phantom, um, well, they're all white with red eyes. You wouldn't think, but I mean, I don't know why that is, but they were all white with red eyes. Um, and uh, I put Golden Child in it this year and, and brought the pattern back. Nice in a nice way with also with red eyes, which is interesting and good. Um, so, uh, yeah, I have to stop by the website and look at that, some of that stuff and, uh, the Facebook business page. Um, there's always a lot of things on there. I try to put, I put something up every day, try to keep that, um, active and, and, uh, interesting. Uh, so, so see Bob Clark reptiles on Facebook and, uh, so, yeah, I don't know. I guess, and I got some hypo projects coming that are good. I I bred hypo to uh, OGS, uh, so that should be uh, <laughs> James. Uh, I've got, I, I just made double hats of those, and so uh, uh, I, that's kind of exciting. Looking down the road, 
and uh, let's see. Uh, I don't know. I got some things coming. Yeah, you're always full of surprises. That's for sure. <laughs> Oh, you can't forget your Instagram because your Instagram, man, I've been seeing a lot of stuff you've been posting on Instagram too. Yeah, I started to, started doing some uh, uh, Instagram, trying to do something there every day or so. Um, I mean, it's easy to do if I just remember to do it. But um, um, yeah, that's I get a lot more response uh, for the number of followers I have than I do from my Facebook page. It's proportionally, I think, which is kind of interesting, but um yeah, and if everybody goes over to the Bob Clark website, he's got archive videos over there where you can see where he's been on TV, where he's done other interviews, some of the older original animals. He's got lots of history on there, too, if you want to read up more about Bob. And uh, he's got a great selection that is really an easy website to navigate and order animals from. Well, thanks Definitely. For, thanks Definitely for check it out. I appreciate that. James, do you have anything else you would like to ask Bob? Or, Bob, do you have anything else you'd like to say? Well, I, I just want to say that I really appreciate you coming on. Um, I'm, you know, I'm always kind of like star starstruck around <laughs> well, you. Happy because, to do it. I, 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 it you know, benefits me. So I'm happy to, happy to um, do that for sure. You know, even when I see you at the shows and whatnot, you know, it may seem like, you know, I mean, I talk to you like, like we're talking right now, no problem. Yeah. But like, I'm always nervous around you. <laughs> you know? I, I, never, I never had that impression. So we, we've uh, we've all been friends for a long time. So yeah, well, I appreciate everything you've taken time out of your day, Bob. Uh, I encourage everybody to go check out his animals. Uh, keep up with what he's got going on. New stuff is popping up. The hypo project is exploding right now. Um, send Bob questions. He's always willing to help. As you can see, he is the master of knowledge when it comes to this stuff, and he's been doing it the longest. So we really appreciate you taking your time out of your day, Bob. Well, I'm happy to do it, and um, um, yeah, maybe we'll do it again sometime. That yes, sounds sir. like That's a plan. Good. All right. Once again, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, thanks everybody for uh, your support. Um, please. Uh, watch the video, share it, uh, subscribe, hit the bell. Um, also, once again, please support U.S. ARC. They are the ones that are fighting for us, and they need their support. We need our. They need our support. Um, yeah, we donate, need become a member. Anything you can. So, all right. I think that's about it. All right. Thanks, guys. All Thank right, you. Bob. Thanks for coming on. Have All a good right. night, guys. Bye-bye.